Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, thank you all for coming. What a splendid day! I, there's something wrong with all of you that you want to be inside rather than outside on a day like this. But I know what it is. You want to hear Secretary Pritzker, and of course, that's what sets you apart as being the smart people in Washington. Thank you, thank you for coming. We're delighted you're here. My name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the uh, president here at CSIS. Before we have uh, public events with outsiders. We always do a little safety announcement. Uh, Jim Lewis, where Jim, Jim Lewis is the responsible safety officer, so he's accountable for your well-being. If we have an emergency, this exit, we, we just came in that one, or of course over there, uh, you'd follow your way through that. The stairs go down to the street, right out through, basically by that door. We'll go across and meet in the courtyard of National Geographic. I'll order ice cream and we'll celebrate our survival. Okay, we'll be just fine. There's nothing going to happen, but I just want you all to know we have some preparations in case. Follow Jim if we need to. Um, I'm very grateful to welcome back uh, to CSIS Secretary Penny Pritzker. It's, uh, you've been so generous with your time to share with us your, your vision, Secretary, and today, of course, to talk about about an industry that's crucial to America. I remember at a time we had something we called Semitech. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Semitech. Yeah, you remember those days. And um, that was a time when we had an awful lot of people said, we don't do industrial policy, but we saved an industry in America. And it was an important step. Uh, and I think we're going to have an opportunity to hear the Secretary's vision today. She's doing a remarkable job at the Department of Commerce. Um, you know, she's one of, just to highlight, I want you all to know, she's championing something she calls the, the Commercial Diplomacy Init uh, uh, Institute, which is to try to put structure underneath the department so it can help American industry compete more effectively in the world. And I'm very, very grateful for that. It's a, it's a visionary thing, and we're glad that she's doing it. It's typical of the work that she has done as she's been secretary. And of course, today we're here to listen to a very important set of insights about an industry that America must have. And so would you please, with your warm applause, welcome Secretary Penny Pritzker, Secretary of Commerce. Thank you all for joining me and joining us today. Uh, before I get started, I know all of us in this room think that the most important things today are going on in Washington. I just want to be perfectly clear, the action's in Cleveland tonight. <laughs> We've waited 108 years to be where we are, <laughs> so go Cubbies. Anyway, Dr. Hamry, thank you very much for first of all welcoming us and for your kind introduction. And I want to thank all the folks at CSIS for organizing this event. You really are always a go-to partner for us and we really, really appreciate that. Um, today's topic is a serious one. Um, it gets at the very heart of the world's fastest changing, uh, fast changing digital economy and the future of American leadership in innovation. A decade ago, less than a fifth of the global population had internet access. Today, nearly three and a half billion people are online, and by the end of this decade, five billion people will be connected. Digital technologies have quickly become a driving force of economic competitiveness, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the 21st century. And none of it would be possible without the American semiconductor industry. These tiny microchips have given rise to technology that our parents and grandparents could not begin to imagine. Cars that drive themselves, clothing that can read our vital signs, Computers in our pockets that keep us online wherever we go. Semiconductors smaller than the size of your fingernail have put the whole of human knowledge at our fingertips anywhere and everywhere. When the first transistor was built in New Jersey nearly 70 years ago, few could have predicted how this technology would transform the world from enabling instantaneous global communication to revolutionizing modern avionics. 
from generating economic growth to transforming our national security infrastructure. The semiconductors become one of the world's most important technologies and the basis of America's most critical industries. Through hard work, extensive R&D, extraordinary investment, and relentless commitment to innovation, U.S. firms have become the world's leading semiconductor companies. And our leadership in this industry continues today. According to the SIA, the U.S. semiconductor industry now directly employs a quarter of a million skilled workers and indirectly supports over a million more. It is the third largest source of U.S. manufactured exports. Of course, many other U.S. industries depend on our leadership in this field. Last year, U.S. firms sold half of the world's semiconductors Yet many of the chips that were produced elsewhere license U.S.-made designs. No industry reinvests more revenue in research and development, driving innovation and job creation across many sectors of our economy. And American-made and American-designed semiconductors are poised to power the next generation of technology from artificial intelligence to mobile communications to the Internet of Things. But we cannot take our leadership in this industry for granted. Over the last year, I have met with a number of semiconductor industry leaders and heard directly from them about the uncertainty and challenges we face. To start, Semiconductor technology is pushing up against the boundaries of Moore's law, slowing the rapid pace of innovation that has defined the industry for the past half century. And if tackling quantum, if tackling the questions of quantum physics were not enough, American companies face existential threats in the form of unfair trade and industrial practices from some of our competitors. <clears throat> the Obama administration recognizes the enormity and complexity of these challenges. It is imperative that the semi, excuse me. <clears throat> Too much talking. <clears throat> The Obama administration recognizes the enormity and complexity of these challenges. It is imperative that semiconductor technology remains a central feature of American ingenuity and a driver of our economic growth. We cannot afford to cede our leadership. Let me be clear, we will not allow any nation to dominate this industry and impede innovation through unfair trade practices and massive non-market-based state intervention. In today's global economy, the pace of overall innovation has never been faster and the competition has never been more fierce. When the playing field is level, American innovators can compete and win. One of the problems facing the semiconductor industry is that the competition is neither free nor fair. Instead, our competitors too often seek to rig the game in their favor. In 2014, the Chinese government announced that it would spend $150 billion to expand the share of Chinese-made integrated circuits in its market from 9% to 70 percent by 2025. To put that per, uh, figure in perspective, $150 billion is roughly half of all worldwide semiconductor sales last year. In addition, we are seeing new attempts by China to acquire companies and technology based on their government's interests not commercial objectives. 
and we have witnessed attempts to restrict access to China's domestic market. So let me state the obvious. This unprecedented state-driven interference can distort the market and undermine the innovation ecosystem. The world has seen the effects of this type of targeted government-led interference before. In aluminum, steel, and green technology, China has invested its government's resources to displace foreign companies in its domestic market. The result, though, has been overcapacity in the global marketplace that has artificially reduced prices, cost jobs in both the U.S. and around the world, and cause significant damage to those industries globally. Right now, we are working hard to address unfair trade competition in steel and other industries. But given the incredible pace of innovation in the digital economy, it is imperative we take steps immediately to prevent a similar situation from unfolding in the semiconductor sector. Semiconductor technology has advanced beyond our wildest dreams because of international contributions and the rise of a truly global supply chain. This industry requires an open, global system of trade to support innovation. No one, no one in this ecosystem can succeed alone. Consider, for example, a microchip designed in California using intellectual property licensed from a company in the UK, could be manufactured in Texas, tested and packaged at a plant in China, and assembled into its final electronic end product in Vietnam. People are employed, and value is added at every step of this global supply chain. This system works because everyone plays by the rules. We welcome China's role as a responsible competitor in the global semiconductor industry. The United States continues to benefit from products and services that we allow to freely and fairly enter our market, including those from China. But we expect reciprocal and fair treatment for all global companies in the Chinese market and in other markets in accordance with global trading rules. China's effort to move up the value chain should be the result of healthy competition and free and fair trade, not state-directed investments aimed at distorting global markets. In addition, no government should require technology transfer, a joint venture, or localization as a quid pro quo for market access. As I mentioned earlier, unfair trade practices are not the only challenge facing the global semiconductor industry. Companies are also confronting a slowdown in the development of cheaper, smaller, and more powerful chips. But let's be clear, behavior that distorts the market and unfairly disrupts the global supply chain is not the answer. The answer is a renewed focus on innovation and scientific discovery. Now is the time for investment, for research, for experimentation. Market manipulation will undermine that effort. The Obama administration understands that the role of government is to enable industry, not to direct the private sector. Yet given the enormity of the challenges facing the semiconductor industry, our government is engaging on several fronts. First, this administration asked the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST, to examine these challenges. On Monday, PCAST announced the creation of a high-level working group that brings together the best and the brightest in America's private sector and research universities. 
led by John Holdren, director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and Paul Odellini, the former Intel president and CEO. This group of experts is tasked with enhancing the federal government's understanding of the challenges facing the semiconductor industry and with recommending ways to strengthen the industry's long-term competitiveness. The PCAST Working Group will release a report before the end of our administration that outlines their findings, ensuring that our next president is prepared to strengthen this critical industry and its contributions to the global economy from their very first day in office. Second, we have increased our technical collaboration with industry to speed up the development of new innovations. Through our network of Manufacturing USA Institutes, run by the Department of Commerce, we are breaking down silos between the private sector and academia and local government to help create new semiconductor technologies and ensure preemptive R&D meets industry needs. So for example, at the Power America Institute in Raleigh, North Carolina, scientists are making wide band gap semiconductor technologies more cost competitive so that they can drive future innovation in everything from electric vehicles to wind turbines. And the AIM Photonics Institute in Rochester, New York is pioneering new chips that run on light instead of electricity and could exponentially increase how much data we can transfer per second. Third, we are using our government's analytical tools to ensure our actions are guided by actual data. So for example, the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security, in conjunction with industry, is currently conducting an in-depth study of the semiconductor supply chain so that we have a more realistic assessment of this industry as we develop policy solutions. And finally, we are pressing other governments not to implement policies that distort global markets or force transfer of technology or intellectual property as a condition of market participation. The U.S. government will make clear to China's leaders at every opportunity that we will not accept a $150 billion industry pol in industrial policy designed to appropriate this industry. Even as this administration comes to a close, we remain laser focused on creating the conditions that will allow the semiconductor industry to thrive. We realize that the solutions needed will not be implemented by the end of the Obama administration. But we are committed to giving the next administration a blueprint for action. But we cannot do it alone. Each of you here today is critical to developing this important blueprint. We need your consistent input. But let me be clear, we need to hear from more than just semiconductor companies. If you have a stake in the future of this industry, if you benefit from semiconductor technology in your business operations, we want to hear from you. I urge you to both provide your feedback to the PCAST working group and reach out to our team at the Department of Commerce. Travis Mosier is here today. He's our semiconductor sector lead from the International Trade Administration. There's Travis. And he can serve as your point of contact. So let me close today with a reminder. The semiconductor industry has faced challenges before and emerged stronger and more innovative. In today's world, when virtually every sector of our economy relies on technology to conduct business, the stakes are too high for us to cede our leadership. 
Our administration is tackling the challenges facing the semiconductor industry now and preparing for the next administration to continue this work into the future. And I personally promise that I will use every day left in my tenure as Secretary of Commerce to ensure that America remains the world leader in the semiconductor innovation. So thank you very much for having me here today. Come on up. Oh, now we're on. All right. That makes a big improvement. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming out. Uh, it is a beautiful day. Uh, let me begin by thanking the secretary for her speech, uh, for Andrew Hunter. Andrew, are you here? For his uh, leadership at uh, CSIS's innovation efforts. Um, I can't believe he didn't come to his own event. Um, and then let me introduce the panelists, because we have a pretty, where are you? Oh, there you are, good. Wave to the audience. <laughs> Let me introduce the panelists because we have a really strong group up here today. Um, David George is the Senior Engineering Manager of Wireless Technology at General Motors. We're really happy he could be here because we wanted someone from an industry that uses semiconductors and not just makes them. Uh, he's worked on uh, things you're all familiar with. He's worked on uh, various uh, generations of the OnStar product. Uh, both in the U.S. and in uh, China and Europe. Uh, prior to that, he was at Nortel, which many of us remember fondly. I don't know if he does, but we're very grateful that you could be here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, next to me is an old friend, John Neufer, of uh, the Semi -Indust Semiconductor Industry Association, uh, well-known in Washington, a great leader for the group. Uh, was at ITI, uh, before that, where many of us knew him. And uh, prior to that, spent seven years at USTR, where he was the deputy uh, US, USTR for uh, Asia Pacific, right? And we have, it's funny, because we have uh, John, who lived in Japan for seven years, 11, 11 years, yeah. and then Ted, who lived in China for 16 years. So uh, we're sort of the, Dave and I are sort of the, the pikers up here. We haven't lived there at all, but uh, anyhow. Our final panelist, they gave me an old bio, so I want to apologize for that. I'm just going to make stuff up, if that's okay. All right. Uh, no, we have Ted Dean, who's the Acting Assistant Secretary at the International Trade Administration. Um, the bio's kind of funny because I was looking at it and I think that's really odd. Ted doesn't mention Privacy Shield at all in his bio. <laughs> but many of you know, of course, he was the lead negotiator for that. Uh, very difficult and ultimately successful, keep your fingers crossed, ultimately successful negotiation. Uh, prior to that, he did live in China, uh, worked in the private sector, and is, of course, one of the leaders at Commerce on these issues. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists to keep their remarks uh, short, if possible. Uh, I want this to be a conversational thing, and we will have time at the end. We've got uh, about an hour. We'll have time at the end for a few questions, so think of your questions if you've got them. But let me start by asking, I um, mean, we can start with, uh, with John. Um, what do you think of the speech? What are your reactions? Um, first of all, thanks, Jim, and I want to thank CSIS for putting this together, this group together. Uh, very appreciative of that. And as far as Secretary Pritzker's speech goes, wow, she really nailed it in terms of the challenges our industry is facing. And I could not agree with her more that it's critical for U.S. Uh, 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 economic vibrancy and national security to keep our industry uh, strong and competitive. Uh, the secretary mentioned the quarter million jobs that um, our industry is responsible for in this country, another million on top of that. Um, I think a little known fact is uh, we are the third largest exporter of manufactured products after cars <laughs> and uh, automobiles. Um, Another piece of it is there's a lot said about how manufacturing has gone overseas, particularly advanced manufacturing. Well, I'll say that the semiconductor industry is a success story, an American success story in that regard. 
Um, most of our R&D is done here. Uh, more than half of our production is done right here in the U.S. And uh, it's been a, it, and it remains a very competitive. It's the it's the world leading industry in the sector. Another piece of this is um, semiconductor industry is a center of gravity for R and D in the U.S. We invest more in R and D than any other sector um, in America. Roughly 20 percent of our sales are plowed back into research and development, um, and that helps economy generally to stay on the, the tip of the spear in terms of, of uh, research. Um, it was touched on by, uh, by Secretary Pritzker, but semiconductor industry is also a deeply enabling industry. It pretty much underlies everything digital, everything in our digital economy, everything AI, internet, cool apps, all of that is built on top of semiconductor foundation. So it's absolutely critical this industry stays stays competitive and strong. Um, also strongly agree that this industry, while strong and vibrant now, should not be taken for granted. Uh, we have some significant challenges before us. Um, the Secretary mentioned uh, we're bumping up against some Moore's Law limitations. I think all of you know Moore's Law is about kind of doubling the number of transistors you put on a little piece of silicon real estate every 18 months to two years. There's some physical limits uh, we're running into and innovation is becoming more complex and more costly and our industry is devoted to the next big leap forward to, uh, to get beyond that. The other um, big challenge, of course, we are arguably the most global industry in the world. We have deep supply chains all around the world. Our stuff is, is made and designed and packaged in markets all around the world. We need these supply chains to be open and clear so that we can make our stuff. Um, of course, we've seen the trade debate um, in this country and around the world go significantly sideways. And I think we need to do a lot of work to repair that, to to, uh, to uh, return trade to, the, to its right, rightful place as an essential uh, component to economic growth and prosperity. Embedded in that, uh, the Secretary spent significant time on the, what we call the China challenge. When you throw $150 billion into any industry, it has the potential to cause disruptions. And that's what we're focused on. You know, our industry uh, grew, out, grew up based on re building an industry from the ground up through research and competing against each other. We think that we, w we, we, would, we would welcome a competitive China market in the semiconductor industry, but we wanted to be doing it uh, along the lines of rules that we all kind of understand and know. And if China is going to throw a lot of money at research and development and compete in ways that we can understand, more power to them. But what we don't want is a uh, uh, thumb on the scale. And I think that's what the Secretary uh, was, was talking about. So, so there are some things that we, we need to happen here in the United States to make us more com help, help us become more competitive, to help us pedal faster, run harder. One, strong trade policy, not an inward looking trade policy. Two, tax reform. Uh, we pay more taxes to corporations around the world than anyone. Our tax rates are, are very high, relatively. And um, three, uh, uh, high-skill immigration reform. We've all heard this stuff. There may be an opportunity following the election to get after some of this stuff. Bottom line, um, we uh, look forward and we must collaborate closely with the U.S. government to um, ensure that a lot of these problems are dealt with so that we can remain competitive and innovative. Thanks. Great, thank you, John. Uh, David, since you're in the uh, consumer of these products, uh, I wondered what you were thinking about this speech. Well, I, I think these, uh, first of all, I wanna thank the CSIS and the uh, Semiconductor uh, uh, Industry Association for having us here. I'm really excited to be uh, here and uh, share at least our perspective on the importance of the semiconductor and the automotive uh, uh, side. 
Um, so so uh, the secretary uh, touched on the uh, importance of that. She uh, referenced the autonomous driving. Um, but, but really, th this is, th there's, th the importance of semiconductor in the, uh, in the vehicle uh, started uh, about you know, over 40 years ago. Uh, some of you probably know that um, the uh, uh, vehicles started in implementing microchips and semiconductors in the powertrain, uh, engine controllers, and airbags um, over 40 years ago. But it was kind of a slow start in the beginning, and, and um, about 20 years ago, at least at GM, we, uh, we led the automotive industry in uh, connecting vehicles. So we brought in the wireless technology in the vehicle, um, and we uh, connected vehicles starting in North America. Then later we uh, uh, launched in, in Canada. Since then we've connected um, vehicles in China, Mexico, Europe, and by the end of this year we, uh, we're gonna have uh, 12 million connected vehicles. And, and, and really it started in the connectivity to, to enable the vehicles to uh, provide um, not only convenience uh, uh, services to customers, but also help save lives. You know, I'm, I'm proud to be part of a team uh, that has worked on OnStar, and I joined GM for uh, over 14 uh, years ago, uh, uh, coming from the telecom background. Uh, and honestly, when I joined uh, General Motors, I, the only thing I knew about vehicles was how to change my tires and spark plugs. But I was amazed on how much technology and semiconductor play a, a role in the, in the vehicle. It's amazing how those um, uh, uh, units, ECUs in the vehicle, the modules communicate with each other, with each other and, and the complexity of the system. So um, we, we started in telematics to about 20 years ago. And, um, but really, it's, 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 it's been uh, uh, growing uh, significantly with the, over the ten, uh, past 10 years. Um, uh, we added a lot of sensors, uh, radars, uh, cameras in the vehicle, and, and, and a lot of that to help save lives. Uh, help make your life uh, uh, safer and you're in the vehicle and, 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 and uh, be able to go back to your family at the end of the day. Um, and and it, 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 the semiconductor plays a key role in, in, in making this happen. Um, and, and the technology has, has uh, significantly become more complicated. And when I joined GM, I was part of a team that uh, was preparing for the migration from um, analog to digital. As you probably know, the FCC uh, about over uh, 15 years ago um, allowed the carriers to start shutting down their analog systems and uh, migrate to digital. So at that time, we started migrating into 2G uh, technology. But since then, we've, uh, we've launched uh, 4G LTE. 2G. That was, that was 2G, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, that was my first. Uh, <laughs> uh, project at, at GM. Wow. <laughs> um, two, two years ago, we launched 4G LTE, and um, it's it's amazing how much more complicated this uh, system has become. But also, it enables us to d to deliver a lot more services in the vehicle. So now, through uh, vehicle to vehicle communications, vehicle to infrastructure communications, uh, these are all enablers for autonomous uh, driving. Um, in, in, in some of the numbers I want to share, if I can get this. Oh, good. I was hoping you'd tell us how many semiconductors are in your average car. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I don't know if I can throw a number on that, but, but I really wanted to uh, give the audience an idea about how important the, uh, the, the autonomous driving and vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication is to, uh, to, to save lives. Um, only last year in the U.S., 34,000 people lost their lives. In, in accidents, 95% of that was due to human error. So the more we can do to prevent that, uh, and you know, before the accidents, during the accident, after the accident, uh, at the end of the day, is, is what will help uh, make safer communities. Every day when I drive to work, I pray for the advent of the smart car. <laughs> uh, John, you said you knew off the top of your head? Actually, not off the top of my head. We did a little bit of research. Wall Street Journal says that it's over 600 chips in every car now. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I talked to a journal reporter a couple days ago and he was asking me about the, the potential sale of Axtron to a Chinese buyer and he asked me what, what all could chips be used in and I actually said it would be easier to list what they couldn't be used in because that includes carrots, socket wrenches and basketballs and that might be about it. 
but uh, this is a this is a central industry. Ted, I, it's awkward to ask you to comment on your boss's speech, so I <laughs> so I won't. But maybe you could tell us um, what did you think the highlights are, and more importantly, um, what are the next steps? What happens after the speech? Uh, sure. Well, and and, and you're right. Uh, um, I haven't been in government that long, but getting ahead of the secretary is something they train you early not to do. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to try to avoid that. Um, I mean, I think what I what I'd comment on just maybe the panel first. I think the the thread that the uh, Secretary was elevating and that and the, both the previous speakers have elevated is just the extent to which this is a foundational industry. And I think when we talk about um, Moore's Law, um, I mean, it really is because of more processing power at a smaller size, at a lower cost, that these innovations are possible. And the um, self-driving automobiles are maybe the best and most uh, sort of the future of the Jetsons arriving in the present example of that. But everything that we talk about and think about around the Internet of Things and so much of sort of the, the most exciting technology uh, developments are grounded in areas in this industry. Um, and it is uh, uh, at that moment of such great opportunity that um, the, the challenge of keeping on that pace of Moore's Law is getting sharper and sharper. Um, uh, so I think that in terms of what are the next steps, I mean, I think the Secretary laid out what we're working on first and foremost, but I think part of um, uh, today's event and uh, hearing from uh, 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 folks in the audience and the call to action that the Secretary ended with was uh, we need to hear from people across this value chain, both in you know, the industry John um, represents, but also every other industry, because every other industry relies on uh, uh, semiconductors. And so we want to take, um, and I know that the, I can't speak for the uh, PCAST, but, but I know the approach they're taking is to take all this in, the work that we're certainly doing at the, at the Commerce Department, um, uh, informally in the policy making process on an ongoing basis and also through the uh, study that the Secretary mentioned at, at BIS is really to um, understand these uh, both the, the technological challenges and the, the market challenges and uh, as the Secretary said also gear up to do everything we can in the time we have uh, but also fashion the work we're doing into a baton that the next administration can, can, can take on. Um, if people do have questions, why don't you hold up your hand. I have a whole list of questions and I'll, uh, I'm going to work through them, but don't, don't feel uh, oppressed. Uh, we have one in the front there. Uh, go ahead, please. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with MIT Seminar 21. I want to know how you propose, because I don't think it's being done yet, you tell your story so the general public can understand it. I mean, when three quarters of our people in this country don't know we have three branches of government, you know we don't have a very well-educated audience. And if this is an important issue, I think you have to figure out a way. I mean, academics write and code for each other. My own view is they ought to have to also write something for non-experts, but I think this is a, I was a part, I, I joined IBM the very first day they started making desktop computers, so I lived through this, this environment, and I'm now struck by the social consequences of what happens now that we have all these tiny little chips. If you've seen the cover story of Time Magazine, it's about depression in teenagers, and it talks about their communication, which is all looking down and how the depression rate is going up. So it's never just one thing which is about trade, it's about the total impact on society, but I really care about how you tell your story to the public. That is a good question. One of the things we've been talking about here at CSIS is if we've learned uh, one thing from this election campaign, actually we learned two things. The first was to turn off your television. The <laughs> second thing we learned is we do need to find a better way to connect with uh, the public uh, here in Washington. So I don't know if anyone, John or Ted or, or or uh, David, if you want to say anything. I think GM probably does a, a pretty good job of connecting with its consumers. And um, my sense is they probably know 
the people who are buying cars know what you're up to. Certainly, the we all know OnStar. We all know we may not know how many trips are in a car, but we know what they can do. So I don't know if you want to start, and then we can turn to John and Ted. Or when you think about explaining this story to the public, how would you do it? Okay, we'll go to. We'll, yeah, we'll give I you a chance to think. We'll go to Ted. I mean, it's. it's oh, go ahead. I don't. I don't know if consumers necessarily know. Uh, the, uh, the amount of detail and hard work that goes beyond mm. putting this technology in there, but uh, I think they, they can see the added number of features that uh, shows up in their vehicle, every, mm. especially folks that are leasing vehicles every two, three years. Um, you know, I, I'm on the lucky side because I get to drive company vehicles, so every six months I'm in a new vehicle, and I'm mm. always surprised about new features that show up in the vehicle. So I, I think the consumers through that, they they see what, uh, you know, the amount of work that we're putting in, and that's all enabled through these technologies, through semiconductors, from, you know, latent assist to, you know, parking um, uh, safety and systems and backup cameras and, and, and uh, uh, super cruise uh, uh, or, or uh, uh, adaptive cruise control. So, so I think the, the customers know, uh, and, and obviously we, we sometimes, um, uh, advertise that um, and, and help educate the customers through either you know the, the advertising channels or through dealers that that help explain all that to our customers. Great. John, do you have so this is an ongoing challenge. Unlike uh, cars, where you can slide into the car and feel the nice leather seats, you don't do that with semiconductors. Semiconductors are not really consumer facing. It's been a, a long term challenge for us when we have issues. It's hard to kind of uh, describe to the public what these issues are because most people don't know what a semiconductor is. So, uh, so for sure, you asked the right question. We don't have a lot of great answers, but um, we are putting a lot of thought to how to bring this message out to the broader public, uh, particularly the message that uh, semiconductors are foundational to everything digital and uh, important to the U.S. economy and to national security and that we need to uh, focus on making sure that, they, that our industry stays strong. And one of the anomalies is that there's a high interest in science and technology in the American public, uh, but not as high an understanding of how it works. And the same is probably true for, tr true for trade. So if you think of this as a trade and technology issue, hard to explain it perhaps, but Ted, why don't you, you've had to do this for a while. No, I, mean, I think on the on the semiconductors and the technology <coughs> side, I mean, in some ways, to John's point, this is the sort of ultimate enabling technology. But you know, we, with uh, uh, fewer, I mean, the, the 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 peak awareness moment may have been the height of the Intel inside type campaigns. But the, but but on so much of the technology, you don't think about what semiconductor is is um, enabling it. I think the you know this is in many ways a a policy challenge. I hope what the secretary's uh, speech conveyed is that uh, within the administration, we get it. We get the importance of this industry. We get the extent to which it is uh, foundational for innovation, and also to the extent to which it is a uh, manufacturing success story in the United States, and we want to make sure it continues to be. So I'm going to jump to a question I had that I was going to say for the end, but uh, I thought I'd throw it out now, which is in, in preparing for the panel, we talked about some of the things we might want to talk about. And I asked if there was still a fatwa or a prohibition against the following phrase, industrial policy. And uh, I was told, no, you can say industrial policy, but you have to say uh, Amer industrial policy with American characteristics, <laughs> which I thought was a nice, uh, nice bow to our Chinese friends. But, um, what do you think about industrial policy? The secretary said in her speech, of course, that our approach is to enable but not direct, which is a little different. Um, is that going to work? What, what's your uh, initial views on this? So I think, I mean, what the um, uh, secretary spoke about in her speech was the central role that the private sector plays in this. And to John's point, this is a industry that is um, uh, uh, succeeded and thrived and innovated through very intense competition. And some of the uh, leading players of earlier generations of technology uh, no longer exist. And that's because it wasn't uh, governments uh, 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 placing permanent bets, but because of competition in the, in the market that this uh, industry has, has thrived. So that, I think, is something, an a, a, a ingredient of the success to date and clearly an ingredient um, into the future. 
the Secretary also spoke about the extent to which, um, then, and, and John as well, the extent to which uh, this is an industry with uh, uh, global supply chains and a global innovation ecosystem, and it is the interconnectedness of those supply chains and that innovation e ecosystem that, is, that has led to the vibrancy and led to the innovations that have, that have been the biggest um, uh, breakthroughs. And I think a central point of any of our thinking about this is, um, especially at this moment when we're coming to the, to the uh, uh, edges of Moore's Law and looking for new breakthroughs, uh, especially at that, that moment, we welcome breakthroughs in other countries. And it is through a, a uh, uh, success in Germany, a success like in the Netherlands, David, or su David. success in Asia, and the combination of that with things that are happening here, that we will in fact keep sort of marching down this, this rapid pace of innovation. And so, you know, whatever uh, you uh, have seen from us already in terms of policy thinking about this, and I think it's safe to say that whatever you'll see from us as we, as we think through this more and, and, and uh, uh, develop ideas further will still be grounded in that basic idea that this is an area where uh, it's private sector led, a competition has been one of the central tenants, and that it needs to be, uh, uh, those global supply chains need uh, uh, free and fair room to thrive and uh, uh, the, an innovation ecosystem that does cross borders. Um, David, what, if anything, would you want to see from the government when it comes to supporting the kind of work you do? Uh, I think maybe I'll, I'll speak for the, at least the domain that I'm specialized <laughs> in. Um, you know, in the, in the wireless technology that we bring into the vehicle, there's, um, there's a lot of complexity when it comes to making this product work in different regions. Uh, mm. And part of it is also the um, uh, reg regulations in some regions requiring maybe some certain safety uh, uh, features to be put in the vehicle. This is an area where I think the, the government can help uh, push some of our standards or the way we've developed those systems and perfected them here into new regions as opposed to have every region starting to define from scratch how to make an OnStar-like system and, and that drives more complexity, mm -hmm. more cost to the vehicle, uh, more time to market. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we, we've proven the OnStar system here for the last 20 years. We've, we, you know, as GM, we're the first company to put in a telematic system in the car uh, we have millions of subscribers today, globally, and I think the, the fact that we're seeing some countries starting to um, standardize or, or, or require some similar type of systems is only creating more uh, work for the automotive uh, industry, where this, I think, I, I believe the government can help push some of those uh, standards um, yeah. uh, globally. Okay. Uh, John, uh, did yeah, you Yeah, so wanna... we've seen many examples. This is red meat for John. Sorry. Sorry. Uh. We've seen many examples of full-throated industrial policy targeting key U.S. industries. And a lot of those examples, a lot of those stories don't end very well. <laughs> the, the, but the reality is we, our economy doesn't address, doesn't, doesn't uh, respond to that kind of onslaught very well. Uh, but it doesn't have to respond with industrial policy. Industrial policy doesn't have to respond with, to industrial policy. I think strength needs to respond. Res so you got to meet strength with strength. But, but I in the case we're seeing now uh, with the China challenge, there are a lot of things this government can do to help us paddle faster. I mentioned several of them. Double down on basic pre-competitive research in universities. That is absolutely critical. We do research better than anybody in the world. Uh, tax policy, immigration policy, trade policy, all these things can help us pedal faster and it doesn't amount to industrial policy. Let me push that one a little further because I think John Hamry in his opening remarks uh, mentioned uh, Semitech, uh, which if, if you don't know it, Semitech was uh, uh, an organization created uh, in response to the Japanese challenge in semiconductors at a moment when the U.S. semiconductor industry uh, appeared to be in trouble and it was a way to help them. It was a public-private partnership, love saying those words. It was a jointly funded between private companies, DARPA, uh, at least for a while, 
to help with the research and help with the industry come up with new techniques. Is, is Semitech something we need now, or is it an outdated idea? What would you do to maybe push the uh, R&D envelope? So we actually um, have a, a couple of things that are out there uh, sunsetting, but are going to be morphing into new programs. One is called uh, StarNet. Another one is called the uh, Nano Electronics Research uh, Initiative. Mm. So there is a place for um, um, public-private partnership to help us remain competitive. And we are in a lot of internal discussions as what solutions we need to come up with going forward. Uh, um, we're creating a vision document along those lines uh, to help us do that. We published, uh, along with um, the National Science Foundation, uh, a report called Rebooting Innovation that includes several ideas. So this is still an informative stage, but we're uh, thinking about it a lot. Okay. Uh, we've got uh, one in the front here. At, uh... Thank you, Irv Chapman. I'd like to ask, uh, those of you who've lived and worked in China, uh, can you cite any examples whether you, your company, or the U.S. government dissuaded your Chinese interlocutors from doing something that their government was intent on doing? And I'd like to ask the industry, uh, how much would tax reform save you compared to that $150 billion the Chinese are pumping in? The, the second que first question was, have you ever seen uh, the U.S. Uh, successfully uh, push back on uh, China for some of their industrial initiatives. The second question was, uh, how much would uh, tax reform save you uh, compared to the 150 billion that the Chinese government has pledged? So I gotta jump on this one, it's red meat. Uh, Dean Garfield, are you in the back there still? Yeah, he, he had to step out. Oh, he stepped okay. out. So Dean Garfield, my, my old boss at ITI, one of the first things I did at ITI was uh, uh, tackle uh, the China, Chinese efforts to uh, require all computers to be pre-installed with a, an internet, internet monitoring software called Green, Green Dam. Dam. Yeah. Green Dam. Major security implications, uh, big problems for our companies. Um, it came fast, huge international efforts to shut it down, and we prevailed. Uh, there's been other similar um, uh, efforts, uh, onerous testing and certification requirements on tech products in China, we're able to shut it down. I think that, uh, or at least slow it down, I think that the key to success when you're taking on a major initiative in China is um, you have to have a uh, strong uh, U.S. government, private sector collaboration, and you have to be, do you have to be working very carefully very closely with others around the world, so it's not just the U.S. Uh, challenging uh, some policies in China that raise concerns. So there are examples. Ted or David, do you want to add anything? No, I appreciate it when John takes the hard questions. It's great. <laughs> well, I was going to add something, which is that uh, when you talk to the Chinese about this, their, their old line used to be, um, hey, we're still a developing country, we're poor, and so therefore you should cut us some slack when it comes to the trade rules. And of course, that's been um, ridiculous for about five years now. And their line has changed somewhat. Uh, and you see a conflict within China, I'd say, between those who would uh, more warmly embrace uh, international standards, international trade practices, and those who would prefer a more nationalistic approach. Currently, the, the more nationalistic approach appears to be in the lead, in part, because of security concerns that are legitimate. Uh, but I think one of the words that I really liked in the Secretary's speech was the word um, reciprocal. And this might be a good word to think about as we move forward with policy. Um, I, I, mean, I would add that I think that the, um, again, looking at the technology challenge that mm. this industry faces, that is not a US industry challenge. That is a global industry challenge. And the solution to it will not uh, lead to uh, benefits in the United States, but to benefits globally, both because this is, to John's point, one of the most or the most global industries, and there'll be players in Asia, China, Europe who benefit uh, w directly within the industry, but also because this is so much, the sort of, like I said, the ultimate enabling uh, uh, industry, 
as consumers, we all benefit. And so I, I think to the extent to which this phrase connectivity between uh, countries that, that is central to our ability to overcome these tech challenges, uh, uh, it's not in any of our long-term interests that that, that that happened. So Jim, you mentioned something interesting and it, it suggests the reality that China is not, not a monolithic place. And uh, you know, uh, the Chinese market is, is our biggest market. It's critically important that we can have access to the market. We have, we have a lot of friends there. We've had a lot of great discussions with Chinese counterparts about how to, how to, how to advance their economy and advance their interests. Um, so I just want to lay that out there that there, there actually there, there, there are avenues for, for discussion to help take China in, in the right direction. Yeah, um, two of the more uh, august uh, CSIS uh, senior advisors who have a long experience with China and I think that, uh, and have just said recently, that, you know, the Chinese are pragmatic and in the long term we should be able to come to an accommodation with them. Um, and both sides will need to change a little bit. But when I think about that, they didn't say near term, right? Um, and so in the near term, particularly we're focused a lot on this huge Chinese investment and activity, but they're not the only players in this space. Um, how do you see the global supply chain changing here in response to the rising cost of building a fab, in response to some of the R&D difficulties, and in response to this uh, Chinese effort? So, I don't know, David, as a, as a consumer of chips, do you want to, how do you deal with the supply chain? How do you think about it? I mean, um, the, the technology that we're, we're dealing with, a lot of it, especially in the automotive uh, space, I, I want to emphasize on that. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that don't exist today. It's not like we can just go a, a readily available plug and play chip that we put in the car. This is, we're not talking about just silicon. There's millions of software code that is developed that sits on, t on, that, on top of that silicon to enable a, a, a suite of capabilities. Um, so it's not like I can just go and say, okay, I'm gonna buy this chip from this mm -hmm. country versus that country. We, we work very closely with <laughs> our you know what we call them the tier twos or tier three suppliers because we don't you know they're they're not they're not the tier one in this supply chain they're the tier twos most of the time but we have very close relationship with a, a lot of those and i can speak for the modem chips that uh, manufacturers where we collaborate we share ideas we present challenges problems and our engineering team and their engineering team work together to create something that doesn't exist today Mm -hmm. So I think to say, well, you know, th this whole thing is, is going to start moving to other places where we have less ability to, to collaborate, mm -hmm. to work, to, to uh, invent something new. It's just going to delay or make things more difficult to make it available to the consumers. And, and, and our goal is to, to in, you know, to develop this technology and offer it to our customers uh, uh, faster, more reliable. Our product development cycle is very long. These devices that we have here, they, they come up with new ideas. They have a device on the shelf within 18 months. In, in our case, in the vehicle development cycle, we're talking four to five years. You know, now I have to be putting the, the design uh, foundation for what goes into Mali or 21 or 22 vehicles. So it's very important that you, you are collaborating with the semiconductor uh, players. You're working closely with them to make that happen. Great. John or Ted, did you want to? So I, I, I think the, the overarching problem here is uh, the, what I mentioned earlier, which is the globalization, anti-globalization, anti-trade discussion that seems to be taking greater hold than, 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 than we're all comfortable with. And I, I think that's something that really is, is, a, is a risk to, mm -hmm. to, to our sector and any sector that has global supply chains and depends on global trade. Ted? Okay. We had two questions, uh, we had three questions, all in this row, so it's handy. Uh, we could start with the one in the back and then work our way forward. Did you have a, go ahead. Hi, Hi uh, Tim Keeler, a question for Ted. Um, in the past couple of years, there's been, according to press reports, the U.S. government has, uh, through CFIUS, um, uh, some proposed Chinese investments with state funds have, have fallen apart, either because CFIUS has investigated or, or asserted jurisdiction. And um, from press reports, it looks like uh, the market is heading towards 
Chinese state funds uh, doing licensing deals with, with lots of uh, add-ons that superficially are structured differently but, but appeared to be in substance very similar and, and sort of just coming in under the export control laws. Is this a concern of, of the government and uh, do you have anything you can say about what you might do about it? So I'm really grateful for the question because it allows me to trot out my talking point that Treasury leads the CFIUS process and you should direct any questions <laughs> about CFIUS or any specific transaction to them. Um, uh, I mean, you know, the Secretary spoke about uh, uh, concerns about uh, tech transfer and, and when tech transfer is a condition for market access and it's certainly something that we're, that we're looking at. Anyone else? I'll just add a little then, because I used to do this uh, for a living a long time ago. I think there is a concern about uh, uh, state-owned companies or companies that appear to have close ties to the Chinese state. Uh, those tend to get extra scrutiny. It appears to me that there are some efforts to, um, and take this word in a well-intentioned sense, efforts to circumvent uh, restrictions on investment and on technology transfer. And we've always had trouble adjusting, uh, certainly the export control rules to stay abreast of the industry. So it's a concern, but I think the central part of the concern goes back to the apparent lack of reciprocity in the trade engagement. But I don't know if anyone wants to, let's just having watched this for um, more years than I care to count. Uh, we had another question up front. Yeah, my, my question is, comes back to the point that you were, oh, okay, my name is Anupam Kanna. I just arrived two days from Delhi. I used to head the uh, policy for the Indian IT industry, which is no hardware at all. It's all software and IT service. But uh, I'm no longer with them. The que question, my question is, goes back to have my, actually, 30 years I spent with the World Bank, and among other things with the Chinese in there. Coming back to this point about globalization of industry, I'm a little concerned when you talk about leadership of the American semiconductor industry. Are you talking primarily about leadership in the technological end, or are you talking in terms of you know, the process, manufacturing, trade volumes, et cetera? If you're focusing, as I understood you are, on technology, there are really three sides to it, three parts to it. One is the material science of it. The other is the software end of it. And third is what I would call more the superstructure, the security, cybersecurity type of issues in this. Now, it's very clear. I mean, if you think about Semitech when it came, the Japanese were considered leaders in hardware, et cetera. But if you look what has happened in the first decade of this century, the Japanese disappeared from it because software intensity changed. Now, in this area, I'm not drawing in the word work of people like Nate Rosenberg, who is no longer living, unfortunately. They point out that user-led innovation plays a much bigger role in software and, and use side. Now, the Chinese seem to be much more open to international collaboration. As you said, the semiconductor industry now is truly a global one. It's not just the manufacturing supply chain. It's actually the technology supply chain there. And I've recently ta had a conversation in Delhi with the Chinese ambassador, and we talked about it, uh, this thing. The Chinese are more open to international collaboration on technology development, whether with the West or with other countries such as India, than perhaps the US is. So my question is, what, you know, uh, are you actually serious about, uh, the New York Times reported a couple of months ago that, for example, in the area of smartphone, mass connectivity and all that, which is a booming industry, the Chinese are decisively ahead of the US. So as far as the world is concerned, that's where a lot of the technological development will be concerned. So what is it that the US can do in terms of getting back into the game in that part of the thing? Or are you really just talking about the, you know, the silicon base of the industry? So uh, a lot in your question. It sounds like you're somebody we should, we should uh, uh, hear from. Um, I think you know to to, to uh, return to uh, some of John's comments and and just the breadth of this industry. And I think you touched on this as well. And I mean, it's one of the reasons I'm so glad that that uh, we've got a a company that's using the technology because, to your point, you're 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 developing things with your partners. You're not looking for something off the shelf. So we re very much recognize 
as we think about this from a policy perspective, number one, that we're not, we're not going to be defining those relationships because they're in the private sector. But as we think about them from a, from a um, policy perspective, uh, the interconnectedness of this and that it is not one narrow slice of the semiconductor industry or narrow slice of the semiconductors industry's relationships with the industries that enables that are, that are uh, important. I, I would um, take a little bit of issue with, with the, the uh, uh, proposition that the United States and U.S. industry is an open, open to international collaboration. And I think in, in um, my view, it, it would be uh, in many ways because um, uh, because the, there's so much runway for the private sector and their work, and because the United States is not, to uh, use the word used earlier, pushing this through industrial policy, it is not about the United States' openness, or U.S. government's openness on these areas, but about companies, U.S. firms that are investors all over the world are partnered with foreign companies in foreign markets and the subsidiaries of foreign companies in the United States and counting on collaboration and innovation that's happening in their organizations around the world with partners around the world and uh, uh, in all sorts of formats in R&D centers around the world. So I, 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 uh, I, I think we can stake a claim to being uh, as open to that kind of international collaboration as anybody and I think that the the um, strength of the semiconductor industry and the, and the folks that, that John represents is in large measure a reflection of that openness. And that's one of the reasons that we're so focused now on making sure that those supply chains and that global innovation system have uh, a, a runway to continue to thrive to make sure this continues to happen. So great question. Uh, people who, who succeed in the semiconductor industry find their niche in the supply chain and exploit it. They find their comparative advantage in the supply chain, they understand it, and they exploit it. Um, you know, one of the things that gives us some pause is explicit uh, pronouncement uh, in China that they'd like to create their, their own supply chain internally. And uh, first of all, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, second of all, it actually threatens to kind of disrupt the global supply chain. So, um, you know, we, you know we, we, we hope that China doesn't go that way, and it certainly will probably ensure that China is not as successful as it could be at building its own semiconductor industry. It's not going to, as I said, ex find the niches in the global supply chain and exploit them, and it's going to discourage the innovative, affordable products getting into them, some kind of domestically created supply chain. And that kind of thing does discourage collaboration, international collaboration. Yeah, I'm, I'm always a little uncomfortable with the uh, uh, word leadership, you know, because it's, it's kind of an artificial concept, you know, and so you'd want to ask how do you measure it, and the measurements for me would probably be uh, revenue and market share, but when it comes to working with the U.S., it's, this is different from China. You really have to work with U.S. companies, uh, not so much with uh, the government, at least on some of the things you were talking about, I think. But it's an interesting point here to talk about um, how the industry is changing, where you find your niche, uh, where you fit in the global supply chain. So maybe all three of you can talk a little bit, and we'll start with uh, John and then go down the road. How is the semiconductor industry changing? What do you see the changes are now, and what do you think it'll be like in the future? By the way, you guys have been awfully quiet. If you don't come up with some questions, I'm going to start calling on you. So, but first they can answer mine. The people on the right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the, the biggest uh, trend in the industry right now is a massive uh, move towards uh, consolidation. We're mm. seeing that in tech generally, but we're seeing quite an intensification of that in the semiconductor industry. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's I, I think, a pent-up demand for the consolidation, and I think it's, uh, it's a, a natural kind of market response uh, that uh, smaller players have to come together to create bigger players to be competitive. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who runs an association, having a smaller pool to draw from, it <laughs> creates some challenges for me. Uh, but I think it ends, it, it takes the uh, industry probably uh, in, into a better, better, stronger territory to compete in the future. Mm -hmm. 
David, when you look at it, how do you see the industry changing and what does that mean for your business? Um, I, I think the, uh, it, definitely we're seeing some of this moving globally and, and, and this is part of any business, you know, mm. this, you know, global presence. Uh, but uh, it's, it's unknown exactly to me uh, how much of that's gonna shift and, and what, part, what technology is gonna go with it and what's gonna stay, stay here. But all I can say is that from my experience, having access to US-based um, uh, semiconductor su suppliers uh, has been very uh, effective in the way we lead the uh, technology in the vehicle domain. Um, and I think the uh, recent announcement from uh, PCAST um, it, it, it's, a, it's a, the, you know, the right thing to do is to encourage the and strengthen the semiconductor business. Not only it, it uh, helps the uh, U.S. automotive industry to be at the cutting edge and ahead of the competition, uh, but also the U U.S. economy in, in general. Hey, David, to the extent you know, where do foreign car companies get their chips? Where does BMW or Toyota or Honda do they go into the same suppliers you go, or do they have a different? You go to, or is it a different it, supply chain? It, it, I mean, the, 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 they do. They do get. I mean, the, these chip suppliers are not just you know limited uh -huh. to the U.S. car companies. Uh, uh, so it's in some cases they um, they may dictate who those suppliers mm -hmm. are. Their tier twos or tier threes. Some cases they just rely on their tier ones to go shop and and select the components to build the end product. Mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, is being being um, uh, engaged with those semiconductor suppliers is is very critical for the automotive uh, mm -hmm. sector, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just you know throw all your requirements on the tier ones and expect them to go do the job for you. Okay, Ted. Uh, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think also a, you know a trend where that's evident all around us is just the uh, uh, pervasiveness of semiconductors in more products, in more places around our daily use and only sort of multiplying exponentially with the Internet of Things. So if you imagine, uh, uh, you know, we think of our um, uh, iPad and our phone and our watch and our whatever, but the, all of the uh, sensors and also in an industrial context that will be relying on semiconductors. And I think that, you know, speaks to the um, growth opportunities in the industry, but also the, it's an importance and the importance of this work. Yeah, it was a dinner last night where they were talking about smart toasters, which was not something I had contemplated previously. Hackable interneted, internet connected toasters. We had a, two questions there. Thank you for responding to my plea. One there and one there. Hi, I'm Amy Dynan with a global investment fund called Terra Alpha Investments, where we enjoy investing in companies that are semiconductor manufacturers and companies that use them. So one of the things I just wanted to ask is that have you specifically, you know, in GM thought about your supply chain and also part of the semiconductor trade industry, thought of encouraging companies to think about their supply chain and where they're located in terms of impacts of, of climate change and global weather patterns that end up shutting down operations, as in doing the water audit, thinking about is this company in a known floodplain and, for example, in Thailand and going to shut down the whole production? Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm that close to that part of uh, the uh, the business. I mean, there is, we have uh, groups uh, responsible for the you know, relationship with suppliers and making these strategic decisions and supply chains. So. I'm not sure if I have the, the right answer for your question, sorry. Anyone else? No? What was the question again? very susceptible to changing climate patterns and water issues, whether it's flooding, et cetera. And there have been numerous examples lately where they've ended up shutting down part of the operation and impacting the final product. Yeah, I know that the, uh, I know that at least the Japanese uh, think about it, uh, but that's because I talk to them. I'm, other people probably think about it as well. There's obvious reasons why they do. So it does seem to be something that companies are beginning to factor into the uh, business risk decisions. Uh, but I, I can't say how much or where it less comes out on the priorities. 
So it definitely is a consideration in the boardrooms. Uh, we've had some uh, examples of some real problems, major flooding in Thailand, some major companies, uh, Western Digital, Seagate, uh, they were completely shut down. Uh, um, so it, it, it does factor in decisions where, 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 uh, where facilities are put, where, where they're placed, there's no doubt about it. Okay, we had a question over there, I think, at, uh, there you go. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Sires from the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Um, I, uh, my question is on the uh, on the issue of security. Um, it's mainly a software issue, but there are hardware aspects to it as well. And I'm really glad that there's a representative from the uh, auto uh, industry here as well, because uh, with recent news reports about cars getting hacked, and and also with the mention of IoT as well, that's going to be a growing concern. Where is security, security in both the software and, and security in the chips, in the hardware itself, where does that fit? Uh, in recent uh, conversations with many people associated with the industry, it seems like it's still taking a bit of a back burner. Um, it, it's abs absolutely security is, is critical. Uh, we, we look at it very seriously. Uh, we have an entire organization responsible for cybersecurity mm -hmm. and their their, uh, their full-time job is to ensure that uh, vehicle is secure from end to end, uh, starting from your, the mobile app that you have on your phone that you use to unlock your doors and start your engine, all the way to all the controllers in the vehicle and how protected they are. So, so we take that very seriously. There's, like I said, there's an organization that is, was formed just to do that. Uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not part of that organization. That's, you know, being, you know having said that, I can't give you more details about that, but all I, I can confirm that it's, it's very important uh, to, to General Motors. Yeah, I'll underscore that uh, security is definitely not a back burner uh, question for the semiconductor industry. It's front and center. Uh, the, the hardware is a key component to uh, the security questions. Um, there's also a question of keeping the supply chains uh, secure and clean. And this is something that the companies uh, devote a tremendous amount of energy to uh, to, to ensure this happens. Because um, if, the, if the supply chains aren't clean, um, that's absolutely bad for business. And we collaborate with the U.S. government quite a lot uh, at the border uh, uh, to catch counterfeits. Um, this is, a, this is a, an area we uh, devote tremendous resources to. Ted, do you want to add? I, I'm also not the perfect person at Commerce to comment, but I would just say it is, um, very, very much a front burner issue at the Department of Commerce. And I, I sit in the International Trade Administration, uh, but in other parts of commerce, in NIST and elsewhere where they develop the cybersecurity framework, uh, uh, cybersecurity issues are a constant focus of really significant work that's going on. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, the, um, a few years ago I would have told you that supply chain was a largely hypothetical concern, but uh, for cybersecurity, I don't think you could say that anymore. Uh, quick question, because we're almost out of time. Um, Mitzi Wertheim, how do the different parts, how do the different parts of government worrying about security and whatever share one another, or are we paying for this to be done 17 different times separately? Uh, Is it a collaborative effort? Do you learn from one another, and are we benefiting from that? I think the uh, uh, short and perhaps not always immediately convincing answer is yes, you're benefiting from it. Uh, the, the, the longer um, uh, answer is I think as um, uh, concerns about cybersecurity have elevated importance and get, gotten more senior focus, and I don't just mean very recently, I think that's something that's happened over the entirety of the Obama administration, that motivates interagency collaboration. So that's not central to what I've been um, uh, working on, so I don't have sort of the, the personal anecdotes, but I know on other things that I've worked on that are tangentially related to those security issues, there's actually very, very close daily people in other agencies I'm talking to you on a daily basis on exactly this kind of thing. So. I just want to touch on something here. It's not exactly security focused, but it is, does have to do with the interagency process. And I, I worked in government for seven years, and I must say, uh, it's, it's the interagency process is not a, a perfect process, but it works pretty well, particularly when you look at how other governments govern. 
um, and in regard to the semiconductor industry and uh, the, the, this effort to ensure it's strong and vibrant in the future, uh, we're pretty happy with uh, uh, the work of the, of the interagency. We're, we're happy with the work of the White House that's take, taken the focus on this. We're certainly happy, happy with the Secretary of the speech today and the launch of this new PCAST group to, to uh, come up with new recommendations for, recommendations for the new administration. So uh, overall, uh, the U.S. government can work pretty well. Yeah, things have gotten better, and it is true if you talk to other countries, particularly China or Japan, uh, there can be a little bit of envy. I have a final question for Ted, which is, Ted, is this the first event you've done in a couple of years where no one has used the word privacy? <laughs> well, now you, now you spoil it. I have, yeah. it's true. Yeah. But I, I can't think of a privacy and semiconductor <laughs> question, so this is your last chance. This is actually your last chance. Do we have any final questions? Well, let me then uh, ask the panelists because they have any final comments they'd like to make. No? Go ahead, John. Actually, I just did, which was uh, we're very pleased with uh, the launch mm -hmm. of this PCAST uh, 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 group, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to uh, working with this administration to support that, that work, and it's very important for us that the next administration hits the ground running on our issues, and we're not starting from ground zero, and that's why we're very excited about this new group. Great. Uh, and thank you for putting this together. <laughs> and that goes to Andrew, but uh, thank you. You can wave your hand at some point. <laughs> David. Yeah, I, I just want to reiterate uh, how important the semiconductor is to the uh, automotive uh, business. Uh, at the end of the day, our goal is to uh, make uh, vehicle driving safer. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and, and save lives. So uh, it, it, we can continue to build that relationship and work and collaborate with, the, with this industry uh, to achieve that. Great, thank you. Ted. And I guess I would just uh, repeat the Secretary's call. Uh, we've obviously, and hopefully the Secretary's uh, 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 speech showed this, done a lot of thinking on this, but we recognize there's more to do. SIA uh, uh, has been a great uh, partner in this. Uh, and just looking to the people here in the room and watching online and otherwise to continue to uh, reach out to us, uh, uh, share with uh, us how you're thinking about the technology and the market challenges so that we can, uh, the policy response is informed by that. Great, well this, the semiconductors really are a strategic industry and so it's been good to have this discussion. Uh, the Secretary's speech and the initiatives I think are really welcome. It's gonna be a hard problem because we, we don't like industrial policy and it may not work. Uh, what do you do to preserve a strategic industry and to strengthen it? And some of that might focus on the global nature of this and how you improve global supply chains, global R&D. But first, let me uh, thank again Secretary Pritzker for her remarks here. We really appreciate her coming. Uh, let me thank Andrew. Do you want to stand up or anything? Andrew Hunter, who uh, organized the event and leads our uh, innovation initi defense in innovation initiative here at CSIS. Very successful initiative. Um, let me thank you for coming out. Uh, it's always uh, always good to see an audience here at CSIS. And finally, please join me in thanking.